Welcome to The Promise. Thanks for joining us online today. If you'd like to know more about the church or supporting this ministry financially, please go to our website, thepromisesd.com. Now, please enjoy the message. Right place, right people, right time. That is a series we are on right now. Right place, right people, right plan. I want to tell you a story one morning. Um, I, I've always uh, enjoyed working from home, and so um, when we bought homes or whatever we did, we always had an office for me at home, and that's just the way I'd like to do it, and I would go into the church when, when needed. Jackie usually worked at the office and ran the church. Well, one morning uh, in South Africa, she left. And I went to my prayer room, and suddenly a spirit of prayer came upon me to intercede. And I began to intercede um, really deep. And if you're not familiar with this, Galatians talks about it. I was, I was groaning in the spirit, so it was pretty intense. It lasted about 30 minutes, and uh, when I was done, I was just, I was done. Anyway, I called the office, and Jackie had just arrived. And I, I, I said to her, are you Okay. And she said, yeah, but I've got to tell you what happened on the way. I said, yeah, I'd like to know. She said, well, she was driving to work. Now, in South Africa where we lived, um, the roads are very narrow. Literally half the size of the church was two-lane traffic both ways. And then there was no um, sidewalks, uh, what, what we call pavements, what do you call the shoulders? It was just dirt and big potholes and stuff like that, just loose gravel and stones and stuff. And she was driving a little car, and she came up behind an 18-wheeler truck. And she wanted to overtake the truck, and so she waited and waited until it was clear. And she took and she went over underneath. Of course, she's driving right next to it. What she didn't realize, there was a dip in the road. And right in this dip was an oncoming vehicle. She couldn't go left. There was this massive trailer, truck trailer, and she couldn't go right because the potholes were the size of her wheels. And she knew she was going to go straight into an oncoming vehicle. There was no way she was going to make it. And somehow, in an instant of time, she found herself in front of the truck. And she can't explain it. Well, I can. Because an angel was dispatched because of prayer that was being made. An angel delivered her. At that moment. How many people believe in angels? How many people think they've experienced angels in their time? All right. So for the next couple of weeks, I'm going to talk about angels. Um, because it's a very important thing we need to know. Uh, and I want to talk to you, starting this morning, about angels on assignment. Do you know that every child, when the child is born, every baby gets an angel assigned to the child? Are you aware of that? All right. Let me show you in the Bible. In Matthew 18 and verse 10. Jesus said, see that you do not look down or despise one of these little ones, referring to children, tiny children, baby, whatever. For I tell you that their angels in heaven always see the face of my Father in heaven. So an angel is assigned to the child. An angel keeps uh, you know, interacting with the Father God if there's anything you want me to do for the child. Now, Probably two or three weeks from now, I'm going to share with you how to release your angels and how we unfortunately have been binding our angels. You might wonder, well, if I had an angel assigned to my child or to me, how come this or that happened? You have to come back three weeks from now. Everybody say, ah. Oh. All right. What, what are angels? Well, the Greek word... Greek word angelos uh, simply means messenger. So an angel is a divine messenger. An angel carries messengers. For example, we know the story of Christmas, how the angels announced to the shepherds that Jesus was being born, Savior of the world, and where to find him. They gave him, they gave directions to the shepherds, you'll find him in this, you know, little place and where the animals are and go down, he's lying in a manger, right? Remember that? Very clear. So angels were used to make announcements. We also looked a few weeks ago at the angel that came to Zechariah while he was praying. And the angel told Zechariah, listen, Elizabeth, your wife is going to have a baby. And 
he didn't believe it, and he was struck dumb for not believing the angel. But the angel announced that the child should be called John. Remember that story? All right. So the angels make announcements, but they have a lot more responsibilities than simply being divine messages. They protect, they deliver, they guide, and they also uh, bring you into, uh, or, or not you, but bring you into prosperity God has planned for you, but they're also used for divine judgment. We see this in the Old Testament. We see it in the New Testament as well. So let me explain to you. Angels are spirit beings. You can't see them with your natural eye, but they do have bodies. They have bodies. In the spirit realm, they have bodies. Now, they are able to come from the spirit realm and manifest in this natural realm. And when they do manifest in the natural realm, they become tangible. You could actually touch them and feel them. All right? So they become real beings. And this is one of the reasons why, when they manifest in this realm, that they can actually do things. They can move motor cars. They can put out fires. They can do a whole bunch of different things. So, but one of the most important scriptures I want to give you, I'm going to give you right now, because it helps you to understand the ministry of angels. So it is found in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 14. And the writer says this, Are they, referring to angels, not all ministering spirits, sent forth to minister for those who will inherit salvation. So angels are assigned to those who will inherit salvation. Say this with me. I will, I will. inherit salvation. Inherit salvation. Therefore, Therefore, an angel, an angel. Has, been has been assigned to me. That should be enough. For, we could go home right now if you would believe that. All right. Now in this verse, it says that these ministering spirits are sent forth, sent forth. The, the, the Greek word for the sent forth describes one who has been dispatched on a mission. They're not just willy-nilly get up in the morning and just go out there. and No, they are deliberately dispatched and sent on a mission. And the word minister, when they are, we are told that they minister to those who are heir of salvation, means there is a high level of... Of ministry. It's a high level of service. Don't think of them as somebody waiting on tables and serving, but they are a high level of ministry. So they are purposefully dispatched on assignments. They are given assignment. So say this with you. My angel has been dispatched on an assignment to fulfill God's purposes in my life. How many of you think God wants to fulfill His purpose in your life? Well, how many of you need help? Both ends. Amen? We need help. Of course we need help. God knows this. And so God has made angels, and He's given these angels specific instructions. Go help that man. Go help that brother. Go help that sister. Go help that wife. They need. And these are angels that are sent to help us. Now, we were newly married, Jackie and I, just maybe one year married. And I had worked very, very hard as a, uh, doing a part-time job. Early hours of the morning, 4 o'clock in the morning until 7 o'clock in the morning every night. And I, I, I used to get 50 cents per visit that I made. And I had to save the 50 cents to buy Jackie's ring and to help pay for the wedding. See, unfortunately... Our parents didn't approve of our marriage. Now, what can I say? We got saved, and Jackie's mom kicked her out. She said, we don't want... And her sister wanted nothing to do with her. So, and that was because the father did something stupid. I'm not go there. But in my situation, um, my mom wasn't happy with me getting married when I was 21. What can I say? My brothers... Everybody in my family, everybody in my family did not want us to get married. They said, you can't do it. You're too young. You have nothing to offer her. Uh, you need to get a job. Well, we got married. She paid for us to live. I was at, Bible. I was at, at college. I was at university. She was paying for everything. 
I married her for her money. <laughs> huh? You had a good job, and I've always kept you working. <laughs> Somebody's got to work in this family. Anyway, we went ahead and got married. I was just 21 years old, and we just celebrated 45 years, and everybody else in my family got divorced. Okay? We were in love. We knew we were in love. We went ahead and did it. So... We're newly married, we're at a church camp, we're sleeping in a little tent at the church camp, and Jackie loses her wedding ring. Diamond wedding ring, she loses it. Huh. So, don't panic, I'll tell you when to panic. Don't panic. <laughs> Let's pray about this. So we pray, we say, Lord, we need help to find this ring. We're living in like knee-deep grass, please help us. Would you send an angel to help us find the wedding ring? The next morning, we found the wedding ring about two paces away from the tent, this deep grass. Wow. Try that without help. Yeah. <laughs> you say, you honestly think God dispatched a, an angel to help you find your jewelry? How many ladies have here have prayed for angels to help you find your jewelry? Come on. <laughs> what else do I need to say? What are, I'm telling you, you, angels have helped you find. Yeah. Okay. And you guys, how many have asked God, send an angel to help me find my golf ball in the bush? <laughs> I honestly believe that God is concerned about the smallest issues in our life. And He is concerned about that jewelry. I'm telling you, God is concerned about your jewelry. If He wasn't concerned about jewelry, why would Jesus be wearing a big gold brand around a... When you get to heaven, He's going to be wearing this... Massive gold thing around the middle. Huh? And the streets are, are made of gold. And under the walls are like 12 different types of precious stones. That's why you ladies like shiny stuff. You're just getting ready for heaven. I'm telling you. Amen. I'm convinced. That God has, to, and I'm going to show you scripture, has dispatched on your behalf angels to help you prosper in this life. So, let me tell you a story. It's found in, in Genesis chapter 24. Abraham wants to find a wife for Isaac, his son. And so he goes to his eldest, most trusted servant. Servant is, runs everything of, of his, runs everything of his. And he says, I want you to go and find a wife for Isaac. So the, the servant says, well, you know, I'm afraid if I, if I go, uh, you know, I, I'm not sure that I'll do it. And he said, listen, I'm going to send, I'm going to ask God to send you an angel. An angel is going to help you to make this selection. Now, in this story, we have the father Abraham, we have Isaac who needs a wife, and we know that the servant finds Isaac's wife, her name will be Rebecca, when we get to see the story. So we have four people in the story, and I'm going to give you a shadow and a type, a shadow, for those who are Bible school, you understand this is a shadow, it represents something else. We can read into this. So I'm going to tell you, Abraham is also referred to as Father Abraham. So Abraham represents Father God. He says to his trusted servant, the Holy Spirit, I want you to go to earth and find a bride for Isaac, my Jesus. And he goes. Got it? The four players. The Father, Holy Spirit, Jesus, and the bride. So now we pick up the story in Genesis 24, verse 7. Abraham says, God will send his angel ahead of you. And verse 10 then he loaded ten of Abraham's camels with all kinds of expensive gifts from his master, and he traveled. So, what do the ten gifts, what do the ten camels represent? Listen carefully now. Since the Holy Spirit is the, is the trusted servant, has got ten camels, those ten camels are shadows of ten gifts of the Holy Spirit. You say, but there's only nine. 
Mm -mm. No, this 10. When you receive the Holy Spirit, you receive immediately the gift of speaking in other tongues. That's the first gift. And that is not the same as any of the other nine. So there's ten. Everybody go, oh, wow. Okay. So make sure you get it. So, he loads up the ten camels with jewelry and with gifts, and he goes on his way. We pick it up, verse 12. Now, O Lord, God of my master, Abraham, he prayed. This is the servant praying. Please give me success today and show unfailing love to my master. Just remember that. He prayed. Verse 13. See, I'm standing here beside the spring, and the young women of the town are coming out to draw water. This is my request. I will ask one of them, please give me a drink from your jug. And if she says, yes, have a drink, and I will water your camels too. Let her be the one you have selected for Isaac's wife. And this is how I will know that you have shown unfailing love to my master. So, the servant wants to please his master. He wants to please his master. How? By making the right choice. He doesn't want to make the wrong choice. Shouldn't that be our desire? Should we want, shouldn't we be wanting to please our master by making the right choices in life? Huh? And you know, we need guidance when we have to make these choices. We need guidance. And so we ought to pray that prayer. Lord, Lord, I, I want to have success in this life. Help me make the right choice. Say, Lord, help me make the right choice. So the servant says he wants to be successful. If you will make the right choices, you will become success. You will become successful. If you make the wrong choices, you are doomed to failure. So you notice that the servant doesn't depend upon his own intellect, his own reasoning, or his own abilities. And this is the problem sometimes with us believers, especially if you are smart and good-looking and thin like me, all of those. You start to depend upon your own abilities. You solve your own problems. And really what God is saying to us is... Don't depend on your own understanding. Don't lean to your own understanding. Trust me in all things. I'm going to make it come to pass. And we've got to humble ourselves and realize it's not about our own reasoning. It's not about our own intellect. It's about asking God for help. And this is a situation he finds himself in. He's asking God for help. He asks God for wisdom. And the interesting thing, he says, if you help me, it'll show that you love my master. It is so interesting. It'll show that you love my master. So, what is the servant praying? He's praying to meet the right person in the right place at the right time. Huh. Do you get that? Being in the right place at the right time to meet the right person. What was he asking for? A divine connection. Not just in anybody. Not just in anybody. You need to have the right person, and you'll find that person in the right place. You need to ask God, God, help me to be in the right place at the right time to meet this person, which is going to be a divine appointment. So say this with me. God has dispatched, God has dispatched my, angel my angel to guide me to, guide to the right people the right people at the right time, the right time in my life, my life to prosper my way. Prosper say, my angel is on assignment. Amen. Now, you remember, you know what this, what this the servant did? He said, he prayed here, he said, let her be the one. Let her be the one. Say this, I'm the one. Come on, turn and tell your neighbor, I'm the one. Do you know God has chosen you? He said, you didn't choose me, I chose you, that you might bear fruit, that your fruit should remain. You know that you've been chosen of God? Do you know that? Some of you do. That's awesome. Some of you are finding out. 
So turn and tell your neighbor, I'm the one. All right. Okay. Verse 15. Before he had finished praying, Rebecca came out with her jar on her shoulder. The woman was very beautiful, a virgin. No man had ever, no man had ever slept with her. And uh, she went down to the spring and filled her jar and came up again. So, Rebecca was beautiful. The Bible says God sees his church as beautiful. And she was a virgin, speaks about purity. When you get born again, listen to me. Listen to me. When you get born again, you are purified in Christ. All your sin is done away with. You're considered a virgin in the spirit realm. God has cleansed you. It's all gone under by his blood and by the grace. Amen? Amen. Say, I'm pure in Jesus. Come on. I'm pure in Jesus. And I'm beautiful too. Come on. Amen. Now, so she represents the church. Rebecca represents the church. And uh, what was she doing? What was she doing when the servant found her? She was just doing her chores. She was just being busy. She wasn't at home, foot up, watching TV or on Facebook. She was actually out doing something. She was about there doing, the, doing what she was supposed to do. See, this put her in the right place. So many times we get caught up out of the right place because we aren't doing what we're supposed to be doing. And we know, we know, we know when we're not doing it. huh? So just say, oh me. You don't have to say, amen, it's not a good thing, but oh me, all right? I say, okay, so we need to be about doing the right thing at the right time. Well, what does it mean? It means just doing whatever your hand finds to do. Especially when it comes to the church things. A lot of time, you know, we want, we want the big platform. We want the big uh, ministry. Well, what, and, and, but this is what you need to start by just putting your hand to whatever your hand finds to do. Just do it. Just do it. I guarantee you it's a stepping stone and it'll bring you to the place where God wants you to be at the right time to meet the right people. Verse 17. So the servant hurried to meet her and he said, please give me a little water from your jar. Drink, my Lord, she said, and quickly lowered the jar to her hands. Uh, and gave him a drink. After she had given him a drink, she said, I'll draw water for your camels too, until they have had enough to drink. And so she quickly emptied her jar into the trough and ran back to the well to draw more water and drew enough for all his camels. When the camels had finished drinking, the man took a gold ring weighing a half a shekel and two braces for her arm weighing about 10 gold shekels. It wasn't much, about four ounces. All right. So, let me ask you this question. Uh, some of you knowledge cats. How much can a thirsty camel drink? Like a lot? Give me a number. Gallons. Give me a gallons. 10, 25. Do I have 30? That's what I used to do. Yeah. Actually, 30 is a good number. Sold. Okay. 30 is a good number. 30. And how long will it take them to drink 30 gallons of water when thirsty camel? 15 minutes. 15 minutes. All right, now for you scientists. Are you smarter than a fifth grader? How much does a gallon of water weigh? Eight pounds, real close. Going wrong direction. 8.3, it's close enough. 8.3 pounds. Okay. Uh, so 8.3 pounds times 30 gallons. It's 250. Thank you, sir. Thank you. 250 pounds per camel times 30 camels. I'm just checking that you're listening. Because I lost you in this mathematical equation. 10 camels, 250 pounds. 2,500 pounds. How many pounds in an American ton? 2,000. Aren't you glad you came to this math class today? Okay. 2,000 pounds. Are you, are you telling me this little girl carried over a ton of water? Over a ton of water. And what's more, she ran. Did you notice that? It said she ran. It said she ran. And she didn't stop until all the camels had drunk water. All the camels had drunk. Okay. 
This little girl is running. And you know what the thing is? She never complained one minute. After like the third camel, I'd be saying, you run. You know? I know. You know? I've got things I've got to do. And one of them is not feeding your camels. Who are you anyway? No. She didn't complain. And she did it with a cheerful attitude. I mean, this is a cheerful attitude. Why? She had a servant's heart. Listen to me. I'm talking about the church. Rebecca represents the church. Ha. Ha. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Cheerful heart. Servant hearted. All right. And and she's, she's running and serving and running and serving. And she didn't say, you want me to do what? What? You want me to clean the bathrooms? You actually want me to throw the trash out? You want me to clean up after the sheep have left and pick up the sheep droppings? What, 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 what do you want me to do? You know, I, I, don't, I don't think so. I don't think so. Nursery? If I wanted children, I would have had some. No, 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 no. Cleaning, the, the parking lot's supposed to be dirty. You, you don't clean a parking lot. Huh? Yeah, yeah. She, she was enthusiastic. Whatever, her ha- whatever it was, menial task, she was enthusiastic. Are you listening to me, church? Yes. Okay, listen to me. Now remember, the angel, the angel has directed the servant to find the right bride. She's a servant-hearted doesn't complain, hardworking. Maybe, just maybe, we should examine our own heart's attitude about what we are doing in the body of Christ for the body of Christ. See, tumbleweed Christians don't do anything. They blow in and blow out. But Christians who get planted and put their roots down and become part of the church fabric and the, the family, they say, Give me something to do. Listen, listen, I've raised two children. I know what I'm talking about. They will not do any chores around the house unless you tell them to do it. Over. And over. And over. And take their cell phone away till they do. Are you hearing me out there? Okay. Amen. Where are the children? Just pointing at the children, just checking you out. Your dad paid me a lot of money to say that, okay? Okay. So, and here's another thing. She had no idea what was going to be offered her. She wasn't working for a reward. How many of you know that you're going to get rewards when you go to heaven? So you know and you're still not doing it? Oh, did I say that out loud again? Take it back, take it back. Edit that, edit that. I was so good up until then. So good. I was doing so good. Okay, so hear, hear us now. There are going to be rewards. There are going to be rewards, and we, didn't, we need to remember that. She was not offered any payment. He didn't say to her, if you, if you, you know, what are my camels? I'll give you a shekel. I'll give you something. She wasn't offered anything. So she only received the ring and the bracelets after all the camels had drunk. In other words, her service was complete. When her service was complete, she received the reward. And sometimes, you know, we expect God's reward right here on earth. Listen carefully. What you receive on earth will be based on what you give. Your rewards for service will be given to you when you get to heaven. Two different things. Okay? So just remember that. So, now, so... She is running with these buckets of water to feed the animals. Now, this is what the Spirit of the Lord wants to say to you. You're carrying life-giving water from which people will drink and never thirst again. And out of your innermost being will flush and flow and gush Spring up, living water. Run with it. Run with the living water that God has given you. There is a thirsty people. There is a thirsty, dry land. God is wanting you 
to be the source of the supply for them. Let me tell you another story in the Bible. Uh, this incident occurs, an angel appears to a man, his name is Cornelius. Now, Cornelius is not a Jew, he's a Gentile. He is an Italian Gentile who is converted to Judaism, so he's referred to as a proselyte, a very sincere man who served God according to the Jewish customs because he enjoyed, he, he saw how they served God and, and he decided he was going to be one of them. So he joined their, their religion, all right? Judaism is a religion, understand that. There are a lot of denominations and there are a lot of religions and that, that is a religion. So he decides to join that religion. Um, this man was a very sincere man. And so he prayed a lot and he gave generously to people that were poor. And we're going to pick up the story because God sees this and dispatches an angel on assignment to him. Because God wants to prosper his way. And he knows I've got to give this man guidance because he doesn't know where to go for help. You know what the angel told him? was where to find Peter so that he and his household could be saved. And you say, well, saved doesn't sound like prosperity. Oh, it is. It is everything to do with prosperity. Heal, made whole, sozo, completely prosperous, abundant life, everything is in salvation. Okay. Pick the story up in Acts 10 verse 1. At Caesarea there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion, in what was known as the Italian regiment. He and his family were devout and God-fearing. He gave generously, everybody say gave generously, gave generously, to those in need, and he prayed to God regularly. Say prayed regularly. Pray regularly. One day at about three in the afternoon, he had a vision, distinctly saw an angel of God who came to him and said, Cornelius. Cornelius stared at him in fear. What is it, Lord? He asked. And the angel answered, your prayers and gifts. Your prayers and gifts to the poor have come up as a memorial offering before God. People, what is a memorial? What is a memorial? You, you celebrate Memorial Day? It's to remember something, right? To remember something. So uh, a, a memorial keeps alive the memory of somebody, correct? An event or the memory of somebody. So the angel says to Cornelius that your prayers and your giving have come up before God as a memorial. What in the world would that mean? I'm explaining it to you. The angel said to Cornelius that your giving and your praying is keeping the memory of you alive in front of God. Some people feel like God's forgotten them. And could it be that you're lacking in those two areas? Praying and giving. You say, well, giving is not that important. Well, obviously it's to God. And obviously it's because as far as he's concerned, he's taking notice of both. And so he thinks they're of equal importance. See, we pray a lot and we do that easily. Well, we should. We pray. But we might lack in our giving. And then on the other hand, we might give and lack in our praying. I'm challenging you. This is your pastor speaking. You need to lift up your prayer life and your giving life. You hear me? Everybody say amen. amen. Even if you don't want to. Okay. Now verse 5 says, Now send to Joppa and bring back a man named Simon, who is called Peter. He is staying with Simon the tanner whose house is by the sea. Now, when the angel who spoke to him had gone, Cornelius called two of his servants a devout, and a devout soldier who was one of his attendants. He told them everything that had happened and sent them to Joppa. Now, I'm going to pick up the story where Peter the apostle is busy explaining to the other apostles why he went into the house of the Gentiles. Because Jews were not allowed to go and mix with Gentiles. They weren't supposed to eat with them. They weren't supposed to go into their home. It was forbidden in the Jewish law. But Peter went because he had a, he had a vision. And so he followed the vision. God said, go. And now Peter's telling the story. And we pick it up in verse 13 of Acts 11. So he told us he had seen an angel appear in his house and say, send to Joppa for Simon, who is called Peter. 
And he will bring you a message through which you and all your household will be saved. All the household will be saved. So, the angel was dispatched to Cornelius and gave Cornelius guidance on how to be saved or who will save him, how to, somebody will preach to him. The angel did not preach the message of salvation or the gospel. And that's the problem with religions that go off the rails. Because an angel tells them the revelation and the salvation message. And it's not their business to do it. It's man's business to spread the gospel. It's not the angel's business. Otherwise, we could sit back and say angels preach the gospel and that. And that's not true. We are co-laborers together with God until the great tribulation period where angels are dispatched to preach the gospel. But for this dispensation, we are required to preach the gospel. So the angel says, go and find Simon. He will give you words by which you may be saved. So the question is this. What, what we do affects people about us. Yeah? Yeah. Uh, as a father... A husband or a grandfather? Do you think your actions or your words or your prayers affect your family? Huh? As a mother, you think it affects the family? Okay. Well, what about people that you work with? Do you think you affect them? What about the church family? Do you think your actions or what you, do you think it affects people around? Oh, listen to me. We do not live in a vacuum. And what we do affects people about us. What this man did, what this father did, changed his entire family eternally forever. We pick up in verse 15. And Peter says, As I began to speak, Peter continued, the Holy Spirit fell on them just as he fell on us at the beginning. And then I thought of the Lord's words when he said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And since God gave these Gentiles the same gift as he gave us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I to stand in God's way? You see, no Gentiles had been saved until then. It was a complete shock to the Jewish community and the Jewish believers when suddenly the Gentiles got saved. The question is this, how did Peter know that they had gotten saved and how did Peter know that they had received the Holy Spirit? How did he know? How did he know? You see, honestly, if I talk with you one-on-one, -on -one, I won't know if you have received the Holy Spirit. In fact, I won't even know if you're saved. I mean, after you speak to me for a while, I could make some assumptions, but I probably wouldn't know, and I'm making an assumption. So here's the speaker speaking to the whole family. The whole household is there, and he suddenly realizes that they've all filled with the Holy, they've all been filled with the Holy Spirit. He says the Holy Spirit fell on them like He did on us at the beginning. Well, do you remember in Acts, we looked at this, Acts chapter 2, how did it happen in the beginning? 120 in the upper room, Holy Spirit fell upon them, and what did they do? What was the first thing they did? They started speaking in tongues. Remember? Mother Mary, right there? Huh? Let it be, okay? She got filled right there. And all the brothers of Jesus got filled right there. Well, that's what happened to Cornelius. Peter's preaching, and suddenly they interrupt the sermon. How do they interrupt the sermon? They're sitting back there, and they suddenly go like this. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Take him out the service. He is messing up. And then somebody else started. And then somebody else started. And eventually, they're lying over the seats, lying on the floor. They just, Peter's like, what in the world is going on now? There was no other way for him to know they received the Holy Spirit. No other way. Face doesn't change. Color doesn't change. Nothing changes. You look just the same. So something happened. And you know what? It was this husband, this father, perhaps grandfather, that brought the blessings of God down in his family. They received the greatest blessings that God could ever give salvation through Jesus and the infilling of the Holy Spirit. If that's not prosperity, I don't know what is. And it was because this man was a giver and a prayer. 
He led the way through his prayer, through his regular prayer, through his generosity. So listen. Open heaven by opening your mouth and your hand. If you want to close heaven, keep your mouth shut. Don't pray. Clench your hand. I know some people, honestly. I mean, when the offering come, you know, come, time comes that, and they grab hold of that one dollar bill, they squeeze it so tight, George Washington gets tears in his eyes. <laughs> your generosity and your prayers release the angels to minister on your behalf. Shout this out loud. My angel angel has been dispatched dispatched and assigned assigned to prosper my way. I'm the one. God's chosen me. My angel angel is on assignment in Jesus' name. Give the Lord a praise. Come on. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Now, next week, we're going to look at angels dispatched to deliver you to deliver people and how angels have been used to deliver and you'll be surprised to find out that it's happened in your life. So every eye closed now.